Hey folks, welcome to The Main Scoop. Delighted to be back and we've got an exciting topic for you today. We're gonna to be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're gonna talk about the application of it today and kind of get some perceptions and perspectives on where we think it is now and where we think it's gonna go. So generative AI and augmented AI, does that does the generative AI replace augmented AI? Is it instead of, is it in, in addition to? What do you think, Daniel? Well, first of all, welcome back. I missed you. I'm delighted to be back. I think it's important. You came right back, you fired straight away, and we're, we're on to the show. Do you remember last November, uh, generative AI even being a topic? Did you talk about it much? No, 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 nowhere uh, near talk about what you're hearing Not at all. today. I right. mean, no, no, frankly. Aware we, of it. We've been using it in yep. different capacities, meaning, you know, the way um, you would interact with your Echo and you were starting to see things like multi-turn conversational AI that was going on. Um, perhaps some of the uh, filtering and recommender engines, the way they were interactively predicting mm -hmm. um, was kind of a version, early version. Or like maybe you were using something like Google Workspace. And you know how when you start typing a sentence, uh, it'll, complete, G, your it'll complete your thought. Yep. And so things were generatively sometimes happening. Sometimes correctly, sometimes as a help and sometimes as Oh my God, that's not at all where I was going. So here's the thing. Generative AI is going to find its way into everything we do. And you know, it's going to impact I industries that, that are highly regulated, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, financial services. I mean, we I'm are gonna be, went there. we're gonna be talking uh, to our bankers probably through some sort of text prompt and stream. And ideally there's gonna be a very secure way for them to be able to see all your info and interact. And by the way, know they're interacting with you. So those kinds of things are there, but we do have a big trust gap that we have to fill before we start moving from, right now it's open internet data, meaning the generative AI that we're experiencing is open internet data. Mm -hmm. That's where we're starting, but at some point all the enterprise, the unique system of record data, the ambient data that exists inside of ecosystems that's being collected in smart cities, that stuff's gonna get used and it's going to be used to generate a next level of experience, but we've got a trust gap, a massive regulatory gap, a policy gap, and of course a, a attribution of content gap that I have no idea how our regulators that still don't know what Google is. So let's talk about trust. Two things, one is it's gonna be the unique data sets, not just the open data sets, uh, that's gonna make agreed, the difference. Agreed. Um, and two is a little bit like cloud, we're gonna find out that it's not the panacea, but it's gonna change every industry. That's absolutely the case. Another industry, it's gonna change big, and it's gonna be, hopefully the focus of the rest of our show is gonna be healthcare another highly regulated industry, yep. another one that you have to imagine. I've heard for a long time, you know, are we gonna have uh, doctors doing our surgeries or is it gonna be robots? Will, who will make our healthcare decisions? Um, is there, are there ways to knock down the doors of HIPAA that have long made it hard to transmit and move information around about patients? These are big things that Generative could help solve, but you know, maybe rather than you and I talking about it, we should bring an expert. Absolutely. I'm gonna bring in the expert because that's not us. But I do want you to be thinking about something about as we're going through this or conversation. The experts, but about the mm. industry, I think we when can we do better. When we close out, we can I'm, I'm going to give you the final question now to close out so that you can ponder it now. I want to know if you believe generative AI is going to replace industry tech analysts. I but sure we'll, hope but we'll, I sure, we'll, we'll, we'll I get sure, back to I that. I sure hope so. So joining us today on the main scoop is Andrea Badnari, and she's a, a doctorate in AI and machine learning and a senior executive at UHG. So we're gonna move into the healthcare space, which, you know, inevitably all of us need to worry about that at some point in our life. I recently did with my broken leg and ankle. Can't even and, tell. Uh, that yeah, robot did a great job. It, it does a fabulous job when I'm sitting, but Andrea, bring you into the, to the conversation. I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on AI, machine learning, and everything space. we just said. Well, first of all, do? thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm so delighted to be here. And it, it's very interesting to, to hear you know, different perspectives on generative AI. Some of the applications we've seen so far of generative AI are more in the consumer space. And over there, there's just a lot of perceptions that, that people have, have brought to bear. Um, as I heard you talk, it got me thinking about an, a novel application in healthcare. When we typically go see the doctor, the doctor tends to give a diagnosis and a treatment. And a lot of that is protocol based. A lot of the diagnosis um, patterns. Exactly. Right? Uh, what have I seen in the past? What does the medical society recommend? Um, you know, that's association of data points, patterns, and then we take care of you. Hopefully, you get better. 
But there's interesting instances where, for example, someone looks like they're developing Alzheimer's and actually they have a Lyme disease. Mm. And that type of unique instance, the type of unique association is not something that a human would normally land on, like a doctor will normally land on in terms of, let's do a test to see if you have a Lyme infection and let's treat you for Lyme because Alzheimer's is a side effect. But with some generative AI, this type of you know, novel associations could be brought to bear. So I feel like that's like a fascinating future. Of course, whenever you deploy AI, some form of automation on the clinical side of healthcare, you go through regulatory compliance. And that's a long, long road. We've seen some shortcuts being um, put forward by the FDA just because they, they want us to make progress as a society. They see the inefficiencies and the typical way of regulating um, new technologies in healthcare that takes like decades um, is, is not really going to get us to a, a paradigm shift. But and, it's and going to be that regulation that comes in the way for sure. I think that's part of why uh, you, you still see a lot of the AI or machine learning or the data that's being mined having to be certified or stamped at the end by a, a doctor or a clinician that's involved, right. right? Because there's a desire in order for it to be certified and regulated to have a human involved that has gone through the process. Do you see a future where we, where we move past that? I mean, I, I uh, you know, Chicago Med, I think, is a, a show that has OR 2.0, and they've got this AI that's advising the doctor and telling them whether or not this can or can't be done. And of course, it's a TV show, so it's like, oh, I've got a greater idea. But is that where we're headed? Where the AI is going to be directing the human versus involved or assisting? It's possible. If it feels right now, based on what we're seeing in the industry, there's a couple of things that will have to fall into place. Um, so first and foremost, doctors do a lot of explaining back to the patient. So the, the good ones do. Uh, exactly, <laughs> but you know, the, uh, coming up with the diagnosis is maybe seconds in a doctor's mind, and then explaining the diagnosis, um, reassuring the patient, is the, the bulk of the job, um, the bulk of what the doctor does today. And if we're able to improve on our explainability of AI methods, we could be at a point where you know, that type of handover of the process to full automation happens. Um, if so you envision it as the AI doing a better job of the human communication and explanation of the condition than a doctor or more thorough? It's, it's hard to measure, so I wouldn't say it will do a better job, but there's going to be instances where we can have comparable performance. Okay. And, and, and are you on the dimension that he was going to on being more thorough or more complete, so not forgetting a, por a portion of it? Th I, th I feel like that is an area where AI can do a better job. Like humans okay. get tired, AI won't. Um, you know, humans will have to optimize for 15 minutes or however long they have with you, and AI can stay Th there on the line Th forever. That's what I wanted to get at, though, is the general consensus of the consumer of healthcare does not find the the experience to be particularly pleasurable. Now, granted, if you have some sort of illness or, or disease, that's AI. already problematic, and that's already, no, just in general, like patient experiences in the hospitals. The whole healthcare. Experience. The whole healthcare system yeah. is, first of all, how much actual interaction and time do you get with your doctors right. in general? They come in, and like I said, you have a whole uh, cadre of people that will be helping you, none of them of which are the ones that can actually fully diagnose you. Then you finally get the diagnosis, and it's, I got five minutes to spend with you to tell you something horrible is about to happen in your life, and then I have to, by the way, move on and do that again for another person. And, you know, I think we also kind of have this other uh, thing that's been going on over this is with, you know, self-diagnosis. The Internet has become, you know, the WebMD and that's a good idea. But I'm saying you go down a rabbit hole, you know, I've I got a weird mark on my hand and you take a picture and you put it in Google and it's like, oh, you're dying of stage four liver cancer. That's what that means. You've it's like, got no, five days on. to get to the hold doctor. Hold on, hold on, back up. You know, there's a <laughs> lot of things that need to happen before this little uh, mole that you think looks right. irregular means you have cancer. Yeah, I want to go back to, to what you uh, called out about the consumer experience in healthcare. So typically when we think about the healthcare experience, we tend to think about the digital I experience, right? You don't think, oh, I had the bad experience because of how the doctor treated you. I feel like on average, doctors are mindful of, of how their communication lands on you, right? They want you to have a good experience. It's very when, limited. When, when you're you in, very little It's just access. limited. And most of your experience is going to be digital, right? Yeah. Now, there's been companies, startups, as well as enterprise initiatives to fix the consumer experience in healthcare. But what we've seen is that the ROI for fixing consumer experience in healthcare is not there. 
because in other industries that are consumer driven, loyalty is a thing, right? If you have a better consumer experience, I'm gonna come, for example, shop with you, then you know, shop with Greg, because I like the experience. I'm gonna pay maybe a premium for that experience. You'll definitely pay a premium for it. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor has it. <laughs> but in healthcare, you don't have a choice, more or less, right? You get your insurance through your employer, your employer presents you with a number of options. If you move states, you're gonna have to switch to another insurance plan, and again, you're going to have a limited set of options. And typically, the consumer probably changes um, the insurance company year to year. And your choice factor is rarely the experience you have with this insurance company, right? It's going to be, what's my premium? Do they have doctors in, in the network, right? Do they have good coverage for the conditions I'm concerned? Like maybe physical therapy is my main thing. So it's, it's a bit of an interesting dynamic that fixing the consumer experience in healthcare doesn't translate to ROI, and that's why it hasn't been fixed yet. There's, there's definitely ways to fix it from a technology standpoint. And there's, there's the, the access to the office or the information when you got to go through a call center. I find bots infuriating. You know, the computer generated. We got to give some credit to those bots. I mean, they pick up accents pretty well. They pick up my accent even when the dog is barking. So I like kind of kudos to that type of a noise. Uh, okay, filtering. so they can understand you, but they still take forever for me to get to the answer to the question but I want right answered. now we might see um, a paradigm shift, especially in contact center operations, because generative AI can humanize more of that experience, right? Um, I, I feel like um, getting the right answer part of it could be just like better information architecture. But once you know what's the information that has to be delivered right now, it's kind of um, a dull delivery. And with generative AI, you can package it a bit better. And you can think more about what's the perception factor, what's the sentiment? Is this uh, consumer coming in frustrated and can I make them happier? Do they want to refill um, and because you know they're running out and they didn't think they're gonna run out so fast? And can I kind of reassure them that even if they skip a couple of days, it's fine because I can read that in the yeah. um, I, I in see opportunity, I, I, I know there is because it's about the data the data set of not only knowledge of what's going on, but of what the human interaction is and when somebody uses these keywords, what they're more likely working for. It, I, I believe my issue with it is more a lack of knowledge in the data set. And it seems like the bot never has the path for the question I'm asking. The good news is that interoperability is, is way more practical in healthcare than it used to be even two years ago. Um, and we have both enterprise initiatives that have pushed interoperability to a point of being pragmatic. We also have a lot of startups that have opened up the ecosystem for, for new digital applications. You talk a lot about having access to data that sometimes is siloed. Having access to more data doesn't necessarily mean that you're better off. Some of the data you would get access to is very noisy, which means that you cannot really take it as a source of truth. It's, it's very humbling to actually see that clinical data in general tends to be noisier than, than for example, claims data or pharmacy data. And clinical data is what you would want to, to make like personalized recommendations, right? Or to, to um, speed up discovery of, of new treatments. So at, at the end of the day, it's n there's no panacea. Uh, you, you have the technology advances right now that make interoperability possible in healthcare, but you still have to think focused. Like, what's the sandbox where I'm going to stitch things together and start to make information flow possible? And it's driven by the challenge, the problem, or the opportunity that you're trying to Absolutely. address. Absolutely. And, and there, there is a lot of noisy data out there. There is a lot of billing and claims data that has gone through the mainframe platform that tends to be more, uh, more well cleansed, more, more reliable, but it is about the interaction across multiple sources. It's not just this silo, it's about federation, data mining, protection, security, and then the insights that you can drive from it, for sure. I'd love to kick this back to Andrea to kind of take us home here a sure. little bit. You know, obviously you have a lot of general perspectives, you've studied the, the AI uh, industry uh, all the way through to your PhD. You're watching, you're observing, I'm sure you're thinking and you're being asked to, to consider the best ways to implement. What's your sort of overall take? When does this really take hold? What's the future? You know, any thoughts about how this is going to evolve? Lots of good thoughts. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stick to the highlights over here. But since we talked about the 
M word over here, I feel like there's a very strong application for mainframes in healthcare, specifically in hospital settings. If you are to think about the surgical hospital or even a hospital that's like a trauma, has a trauma center, if there's an earthquake and you can no longer connect to something like a cloud, then you still need to have access to the patient record to see what medications they're on or what type of conditions they have. You would want that data to be locally stored on a mainframe, like well encrypted. So I feel like mainframes are, are, are definitely um, well suited for, for us to manage uh, through disasters and to have a fallback in a certain you know, high critical settings. Um, now, going back to AI and how long it's gonna take for it to be implemented in healthcare, we are seeing good progress already on the administrative side. So when you start to solve for business workflows by either augmenting or automating them on the administrative side in claims processing and um, managing prior authorization submissions, there's point solutions that are backed by AI that are being adopted at scale. Now, in healthcare in general, technology gets adopted through regulation. So it's not like someone comes up with an innovation and everyone is on it, right? It's the best thing, you know, it, it just like gets deployed at scale. It tends to be a slow moving train just because the industry is uh, risk adverse. So we are working and hoping that the government will start to put more regulatory frameworks in place that um, give healthcare stakeholders some reassurance about where they can deploy AI and some guidance about how to deploy AI. So we can transition from the administrative into the clinical side. I feel like on the clinical side is where there's the most need and the most potential for AI. But at least we're building a bit of status quo by solving for administrative applications. And by the time the regulatory framework enables deployments in clinical, we'll be you know, ready to sail at full speed. And as she even cool. got, a, she got a sailing reference in, Greg. Andrea, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here on the Main Scoop today. Thank you for having me. It's my it was pleasure. a pleasure having you. I hope you folks enjoyed this. It really was a topic about artificial intelligence, but having Andrea here, we had our own AI. She's actually intelligent. And is she a bot? She's not a bot. She's not a bot. She's a real person. Hey, so you told me at the end, I'm gonna have to answer that question. I wanna take you up on that. Well? I'm building a GPT. Yeah. So yes, I and, actually and genuinely believe that most will information you services- Will you continue to get paid? I don't know. Or will the, the GPT be Well, I'm, I'm, I actually, I'm, re I'm rerouting, I'm rerouting all of the uh, payments using a, a generative to a new routing number that my bot has set up and I'll just suddenly be broken. I won't know what happened. So, uh, you know, there's a kill switch operator job opening up. <laughs> so when we have to, when this is over, we, we have to hit the, oh my God, hit that kill switch so we don't end up in 2001 in Space Odyssey. And that, no, I won't open the door. <laughs> yes, you will open the door. Uh, and I know we could go on and on with this. Let's just put it this way. I think there was a data point that came out that I think 40% of the Fortune 1000 CEOs think by 2030 that their business models will be completely uh, of no, uh, they, they will be completely disrupted. They will no longer be relevant. So that's within five to six, six years. I can't do math. I'm doing math. So my point though is, is that it's something that came from pretty much nowhere in six months has made most of the Fortune 1000 CEOs say our business model will no longer be relevant. Greg, that's crazy. That's awesome. That's why, that's why we you know, brought this topic to, to bear, Greg, is I mean, mainframe at the core will be a big part of the generative AI story. I but agree. in the end, this is gonna change every business, it's gonna change every industry, and hopefully all the people that are part of our main scoop community uh, have enjoyed this show. Hey everybody out there, hit that subscribe button. We loved having you as part of our main scoop. Greg Locko, welcome back, we missed you. Happy to be here. For Dan, for Greg, for myself, for the main scoop. We'll see y'all later. <laughs>